a classy couple, Nigel and Fiona, encounter another couple, Oscar and Mimi, during a cruise. Nigel is captivated by Oscar's suggestive and sadistic past with Mimi. This impacts his marriage with Fiona. Hey everyone and welcome back to Movie Time. Today we're covering a movie recap about the 1992 romantic thriller drama movie Bitter Moon. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to Movie Time if you like the recap. Released four years after Frantic, 1988, one can't help but think that Polanski had spent those four intervening years thinking carefully and perhaps obsessively about what his next project would be. That four-year gap was his longest interval between films since the one he had between Tess, 1979, and Pirates, 1986, the latter gap of seven years coinciding with some things in his personal life that need not be mentioned here. On its release in Europe in 1992 and North America in 1994, Bitter Moon was not a commercial success and received mixed reviews from critics. Some commented that and quote, Roman Polanski approaches rock, bottom and quote, and called the movie with a tone that veers from comedy to intimate game playing, Janet Maslin wrote in the New York Times, and quote, whatever else Mr. Polanski may be, nasty, ridiculing, darkly rebellious in his view of the world, he definitely isn't dull, bitter, moon is the kind of world-class, bold film that has a life of its own, and quote, a positive comment, came from a reviewer, who said and quote, Polanski directs it without compromise or regret, and it's a funny thing how critics may stoop to it, but while they're watching it you could hear a pin, Obsession partly as deeply ironic black comedy and quote, and quote, rich and darkly disturbing and quote, and, and quote, also wickedly entertaining, and quote, reviewing the film in 2009, Scott Tobias wrote, and quote, Bitter Moon is my favorite of the later period Polanski films, nasty, potent, and psychologically naughty in a way that recalls the devil may care, on von terrible Polanski of old, and quote, according to journalist Matthew Tempest, he and film director Christopher Nolan, Shared and quote, a soft spot and quote, for Bitter Moon as students. Well, Bitter Moon, like its predecessor, Frantic, is an evolution of Polanski's rendering of the thriller genre, a mode he's had a taste. But throughout his entire career, starting with Knife in the Water and culminating most recently in The Ghost Writer, Bitter Moon, like his best in the genre, has that Hitchcockian quality that makes the viewer simultaneously fear and desire to see what happens next. That's good. The new element, in Bitter Moon, however, is an admixture of romance, a very welcome addition, it turns out as this. Is one of most folks' favorites of Polanski's films, even though it was considered a failure at the time. The movie begins with Nigel Dobson and his wife Fiona, who are a perfectly respectable British couple with nuances of gentlemanly life. During their honeymoon, they are on a cruise to India. They meet Mimi, a very excited young French woman who is exceedingly flamboyant and Paris Cosmopolitan, and it is through her they meet Oscar, an American wannabe author who is disabled and in a wheelchair. Oscar begins telling Nigel and Fiona about their love story. Nigel becomes absolutely captivated with Mimi and Oscar's love-hate tale, despite the fact that Fiona considers it gruesome and unpleasant and does not want to know how it ends. Oscar finds a willing partner in Mimi, a student dancer, for his almost intense intimacy games, and the two are constantly pushing their boundaries together. He has captivated her completely, and she submits to his every whim. However, without any further reason for his caprice, he gets bored out of his wits. About her, he treats her rudely and cruelly, so Mimi packs her things and prepares to leave him forever. She re-enters the flat after opening the door of the condo where they had been living. Together, she wants to stay no matter what. Life will be hell for Mimi from that moment on. He becomes really abusive towards her, and she puts up with everything. Their suggestive antics become sadistic, full of anger and twisted mentality. Well, it looks like Mimi becomes a mere shadow of her former self. She has stayed with him, but life becomes a nightmare. She must quit all her life and interests in order to pursue her obsessive love for him. She has to do things she doesn't really want to because if not, Oscar will send her packing for good, and she knows this time there won't be a second chance. Finally, she becomes pregnant, and that's a door for her to lead a normal couple's life with Oscar. They agree to leave France together and keep the child. However, Oscar's behavior is selfish and rotten once more. He pretends to follow suit her, but when they are both on the plane to Martinique, he leaves the plane with some dumb excuse. Mimi is completely distraught, and you will be shocked to know what she did afterward. She had an abortion performed by some doctor who butchered her and had to surpass a terrible infection on her own. The surgery and its consequences have left her incapable of getting pregnant again, and that comes as a shock to her as well. Meanwhile, Oscar continues his joyful life, attending parties, getting drunk, and engaging in suggestive relationships with a variety of women. He doesn't appear to be a brilliant author. He gets so intoxicated that he suffers a car accident that leaves him paralyzed for the rest of his life. Mimi goes back to Paris because her tragic experiences haven't made her forget about him. She refuses to forgive him, but it is later revealed how much she loves him despite everything. She is upset, enraged, and seeks revenge for everything Oscar has put her through despite her love. 
She looks after him in a strange and nasty way. She doesn't allow him to talk to any of her former lovers or go out of home without her. One of the pervert things she did is to hold a long conversation leaving Oscar in the full of water bath. While she's talking in a joyous manner, the water gets colder and colder, so Oscar has to leave the bathroom crawling like a worm. Mimi sees this with a half smile onto her lips and continues to chat as though she doesn't care about what's happening in the world around her. On another occasion, she gives him a present, a gun, with a single bullet so that he can finish himself. After that, Fiona seemed to be completely fed up with Nigel. She's afraid he wants to be intimate with Mimi because she's always flirting with him and dropping hints. She assures him that she is better than him at everything, so she begins flirting with Dado during Oscar's narrative sessions. When Nigel goes looking for Fiona, she finds her in bed after making love to Mimi, much to his surprise. Oscar was also watching them when they were having an intimate moment. He fires Mimi with his gun, when both women are sleeping in a cuddle. Because of the noise, Fiona is awakened, and Nigel and Fiona leave the lodge. Together, terribly traumatized by what they have seen. Well, overall, the movie has great performances and casting all around. Hugh Grant plays the naive yet curious protagonist that is a substitute for the male audience, similar to the function the Kyle MacLachlan character serves in. Blue Velvet, Peter Coyote plays the demented Lothario, almost like an id embodiment, that keeps wetting the audience's curiosity with his lurid storytelling. Like all stories dealing with the extremes of intimacy, it arrives at moments when we can barely prevent ourselves from laughing. There is a reason for this. S&M combines humorless scenarios with absurd choreography. It is the easiest thing in the world to walk out of a movie like Unquot, Bitter, Moon and Quat, shaking our heads wearily and complaining about Polanski's taste, bizarre situations, and fevered imagination. The purpose, of course, is to prove that we didn't fall for it, that we are much too mature, serious, and well-balanced to be taken in by his juvenile fantasizing. Well, of course, and Quat, Bitter Moon and Quat, is wretched excess. But Polanski directs it without compromise, or apology, and it's a funny thing how critics may condescend to it, but while they're watching it, you could hear a pin drop. In another scene, as Nigel hears about games with masks and leather g-strings, he becomes predictably charged. It's just a matter of time before he's taking every opportunity to slip away from Fiona to hear the whole thing. Oscar's descriptions which the audience sees in extended graphic flashbacks also cause Nigel to feel passionately drawn to Mimi. A woman who seems tragic, stimulated, and in need of tenderness. There's much more to this picture. As Oscar's narrative reveals, Polanski, who scripted the shenanigans with European script doctor, Gerard Bratch and John Brownjohn, revels in his usual themes and trickery. And Quat, Moon, and Quat, like most of his films, is about multiple levels of entrapment. Everyone seems to be enslaved by themselves and each other. Of course, they're all stuck at C2. And ultimately, no one is what he seems. Above all, and Quat, Moon and Quat, is abundant with horseplay as the Polish director rolls out his array of shock tactics and black humor, at the height of a steamy encounter between Oscar and Mimi which involves tongues, bodies, and a creamy bottle of milk, something happens abruptly, which causes audience members to jump, then laugh at themselves for doing so. After 36 years of making movies, Polanski may be off his creative rocker, but he's still having fun. Bitter Moon is, without a doubt a must-see for Polanski's fans and those who have followed his career, it's his most interesting film since Chinatown and The Tenant in the 1970s. For other viewers, it's a curiosity that's worth a look. It's also the kind of work that we associate with European filmmaking. American movies that are trying to delve into the mystique of intimacy, passion, and suggestiveness often end up making ridiculous statements, as was evident in 91 Half Weeks and Basic Instinct. The best performance of the film, however, is Emmanuel Cena. Her emotional state and psychological position in the character dynamic move sharply between extremes in this movie, and afterward the central image the viewer has imprinted in their mind is of Cena's expressive face. Kristen Scott Thomas also gives a good performance, although her character has considerably less screen time than the other three characters. Though, there is something emotionally unsatisfying about it, but then again, emotional disappointment is precisely what the movie is about. Thanks for watching everyone. If you liked the video, make sure to hit the subscribe button for more upcoming movie time recap videos. See you next time. Also, don't forget to let me know how you feel about today's video in the comments down below. Till then be safe and stay well.